Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac. And with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I'm excited for our first video episode here. Uh, we're going to see how that goes. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I mean, we could we could talk about uh, us using Shotcut uh, for that. I mean, this is what we I've been using personally uh, for the the YouTube videos. Just going through that and, and using it as a very straightforward, simple uh, video ed- editor. Um, I have I, I I know throughout the time uh, the the time that I've been learning Shotcut, I've amassed these uh, shortcuts and defaults that I rely heavily on and you're going to be thrown in there uh, vanilla without any of them. So you're going to be learning as you go and, and setting up your own defaults. Like I, I got my favorite effects and, and all that put in there and I have like the color preloaded and, and, and just all of this stuff that you will, I guarantee be struggling with the first couple of times uh, until you get your, your feet under you. The but after that, it, yeah. it's, it's a really, really fun experience. I, I really do enjoy uh, video editing and I, I, I enjoy audio editing as well. Um, it's, it's about as artistic as I get without actually being artistic. Fair enough. Yeah. Other than that, how are you doing over there? Pretty good. I saw you had some news items here. Uh, some intro items, if you wanted to touch on those. Yeah, uh, between the two, which one do you want to look at first? I don't have. This DST root certificate authority expiration. Do you want to take a look I at think, that one? Yeah, I, I think the one sentence here to take out of that is 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 this one here. Uh, DST root CA X3 will expire on September 30th, 2021. That means that these older devices that don't trust ISRG root X1 will start getting certificate warnings when visiting sites that use Let's Encrypt certificates. Uh, there's one important exception. Older Android devices that don't trust ISRG root X1 will continue to work with Let's Encrypt thanks to a special cross sign from DST root CA X3 that extends past that root's expiration. So what what are certificates and, and why does this matter? And I know we're trying to keep the segment shorter, so I'll, I'll, I'll try not to go into a rant mode here, but certificates are, are very odd and and almost antiquated because they they come bundled with a whole bunch of software that you have if you install java you're installing certificates if you install a browser you're installing certificates and and many uh, operating systems as well come with certificates pre-installed and this is a central authority generating these and and cross-signing them and you know cross verifying everyone's verifying everyone else's thing and and one is held up to be the canonical no pun intended uh version of it and and you you get these certificates and you install them into your browser and and that's what lets you install or connect with https right i mean that's that's what you're looking for you're looking for any one of the multitude of certificates that have been distributed to you to match um, or, or to have signed uh, the certificate that's being presented to you by the web page. And, and this works with any kind of connection string. You, you can work with SSH, you can work with um, any other kind, like IMAP, right, for like uh, mailboxes. Uh, you're going to use this this kind of certificate verification. And and this this cross-signing issue is one where they're trying to bootstrap a brand new root authority, right? So I mean, this is this is a or certi- certificate authority. So this is this is a new certificate authority. Let's encrypt, right? They were piggybacking off of DST's uh, root certificate. So I, I think it's DST or whichever whichever company had, had provided the the already trusted certificate to cross sign. Let's Encrypt's certificate so that it could start to be widely dis- distrib- dis- distributed, right? And and once it got that distribution, then it could kind of break off on its own per se, right? It could it could no longer rely on that cross signing. They, they're not saying, all right, we're gonna have the root certificate actually cr- sign Let's Encrypt. Uh, now at this point, Let's Encrypt is, is standing on their own. 
So the problem comes up with you're in an ever evolving ecosystem, but you have hard coded devices who are never getting updated, who won't have those new certificates and they will not know to trust the new let's encrypt certificate because as the certificate turn, I guess you could call it happens as, as the operating system updates these, as the browser updates these, et cetera, et cetera, right? You're going to get a chance to install let's encrypt as a trusted verified root, you know, the signing certificate. But if you have old devices who haven't gotten an update for the last 10 years, which is a lot of devices, right? Don't, right. don't think that that's, you know, unheard of. That's actually a, 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 a enough devices for this to be somewhat concerning. So we, we say that, you know, let's encrypt at this point for normal browsing is, is completely sufficient, right? But anything that starts going out to a Let's Encrypt site that hasn't been updated in that amount of time is not going to understand the Let's Encrypt certificate, right? So this announcement, you know, they, they, they say in their last paragraph, what should you do? For most people, nothing at all. And, and hopefully now we understand why, right? Uh, we've set up our certificate issuance, so your website will do the right thing in most cases, uh, favoring broad capability, yada, yada, right? So it's it's these old devices that are connecting to your new stuff uh, that's really going to be the problem. But for the most of most part, uh, most of us, it's it's going to be transparent, right? Just uh, fine, right? Because our new certificates are already installed and working. And this is actually a really interesting case study in in bootstrapping a new certificate authority because we haven't had one of those in a long time. Uh, and and let's encrypt. You know, it has has many different things that it's it's known for. Most importantly, it's automated ACME uh, certification signing. You know, where where it's able to take uh, programmatically a certificate request, sign it, and then uh, return it to the user based on you know uh, well known file uh, verifications or DNS verifications or, or or a number of ways of doing this, um, which has helped a lot of people get encrypted and and so much so that. I think last episode or what, maybe this episode, I don't, I, I forget if I just didn't put it in the show notes, but uh, so the EFF um, is now deprecating uh, the HTTPS everywhere browser extension uh, because in their minds, they've gotten to the point where they wanted to get to. They've said, well, look at the web now. Most everything is encrypted. Whereas back in 2004, 2005, that was not the case. Right. So in, in the last 15 years, they have come a very, very long way. And as, as a part of this, you know, it is uh, a, a signal really of, of that success, right? So I'm, I'm actually happy to hear that they're deprecating that. Um, sad because that does provide some functionality. One, one of the functionality that I use it for a lot was the ability to upgrade automatically, right? If I go to HTTP uh, colon slash slash something, right? If I don't put that HTTPS, if, if the link I'm clicking on isn't a secure link, uh, it would automatically upgrade the connection. It would say, hey, before I connect to HTTP, is there a secure connection that I could connect to? It would, it would ping the web server to see if, if that was the case. And if so, then it would connect to that that service instead. Um, so that automatic upgrade could happen. Now, a lot of websites, uh, as we've coded in our Compose, will take an HTTPS request and automatically upgrade it. It'll return to the browser at 301 and it'll say, please upgrade me to HTTPS, whatever subdomain you were going to, right? So, so it'll do that automatic upgrade for you. Uh, but for web servers that don't do that, this extension was really nice to have because it would it would preempt that uh, by reaching out to the web server for an HTTPS connection. Yeah, and like you said, though, a lot of these websites are HTTPS by default now. So, I mean, kind of, I didn't know that. Kind of interesting that you pointed that out, that EFF is disabling or what, deprecating their HTTPS everywhere. So, I didn't know that. I like that one. Uh, we may have to include that in the show notes. I don't know if that's recent news or if that if was it wasn't in the last a, while, episode, a couple months ago. I, I, I must have put it in for this episode and not pasted it in the show notes. So I can I can definitely throw that in there for sure. Uh, and, and really talking about web browsers, I mean, that's that's what our next topic is about, uh, what your web browser says about you. Uh, and and I'm not sure that I I follow all the way to the conclusion, right? I, I, but I did want to touch on uh, why uh, 
Michael Hausman uh, came to the conclusion that he did, right? So he was looking at people who uh, were using different browsers, right? So uh, him and his team uh, captured information about which internet browser employees had used when they logged in to apply for their jobs, right? So he tested whether that choice may be related to quitting. Now, as far as causation and correlation, I'm not sure he has a really strong case to be made here, but he does put some interesting effort into the thought process behind what makes a user choose Firefox or Chrome over Internet Explorer, or in this case, Edge or Safari, right? And his, his thought process goes like this, you know, after 90 days on the job, the Firefox and Chrome users had customer satisfaction levels that Internet Explorer and Safari users reached only after 120 days at work, right? So why is it the browser that's causing that? Probably not, right? Uh, the obvious answer was that they're more tech savvy, right? So they, they took a look at c computer proficiency tests and said, no, the, the Firefox and Chrome group didn't actually prove to have any more significant computer experience and they weren't faster or more accurate typists. So that explanation kind of went down the tube. Uh, the one that they settled on here was that to get Firefox or Chrome, you had to demonstrate some resourcefulness and download a different browser. Instead of accepting the default, you must take a bit of initiative to seek out an option that might be better. And that active initiative, however tiny, is a window into what you do at work. Uh, really, it's you know purporting to be a window into your characteristics, you know, as as a employee, as a computer user, right? Um, and, and, and really just kind of uh, in, in general. So they were, you know, they, they were talking about, you know, when, when people uh, who were running in Firefox or Chrome, when they encountered a situation they didn't like, they fixed it. Uh, having taken the initiative to improve their circumstances, they had little re reason to leave, right? Uh, so they created the jobs that they wanted, uh, but he, he says here that they were the exception, uh, not the the rule, and and he goes in and rationalizes it um, using some psychology that I don't necessarily agree with. But up to that point, up to that point, I would say that's most likely going to be the 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 breaking point. And and we all know at at some point that you can accept the default, and and it's 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 known, right? It's called the tyranny of the default. Right. It's it's a known phenomenon. People know that the default tends to stick around just because of, you know, the inertia that it has. Right. Especially you think of uh, operating systems. Right. right. Who's going to who's going to change a browser when they have a whole bunch of computer other stuff that they got to do. Right. And that's fixing, especially if right, their day sure. is not revolving around computers. They have actual real world stuff that they have to do. Right. So so they're. Their core component, their their core reason for using a computer is not to get the best experience out of it, right? It's to get just to get their work job done. done, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and and so the the people who chose Firefox or Chrome, for one reason or another, identified that something might be better, right? Which in is is a is a leap, right? That that not everyone makes and and you know you might you may chuckle at that but it, it it really isn't you know some people are just okay to accept what they're just given right the defaults sure yeah and part of marketing right part of promotion pr part of you know getting the word out is is to to tell people that there is a better alternative and that it fulfills one of their needs, right? So these people obviously had had identified their needs either independently or through contact with with someone else, usually probably like a tech savvy nephew or you know who, whoever, right? And being able being exposed to that led them to say, hey, you know what? Maybe I should try this thing out. You know, because it has these different extensions I could use, or you know, what whatever that need was that drove them to that. And it it's it's very hard to 
find those needs, right? Especially if you're you're marketing something, if you're trying to get the word out about something, if you don't know who you're talking to, right? Because if I'm if I'm talking to, you know, my parents, it's gonna be a lot different conversation I have than if I'm talking to, you know, my buddy at church, right? It's going to be a, a, a lot different conversation when I'm talking to someone who's working in a corporate environment versus someone at a startup, right? So to find the need is really the only way that you're going to have to get someone to, to change their behavior. Sometimes they go out and find it for themselves because people people feel needs. I mean, it's it's not that they never feel needs and you have to tell them what their needs are, right? It's that sometimes it's not as important to them because they think maybe it's not hurting me as much but in the long run right if you can if you can show that hey you will be materially better given given a change in your situation right and if you can if you can make that case and you can you can lead them to that understanding then you can start looking into how can I, how can I help you? Right. This, and, and, and here's the ways I can, I can help you. Um, and I'm going to go into depth in the later part of this episode, uh, as okay. to how, uh, this can, you, you, you can, you can do that, but, but, uh, the argument is not that you can logic them into it. That is almost never the case. Um, there are a lot of different, um, emotional components in play, uh, and a lot more to the ecosystem around them that they function in, uh, than we would like to believe. But like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that later and, uh, and we'll go down that rabbit hole. But for the time being, I thought this was a really, really good example, uh, of, of some people who change their circumstances versus some people who don't. Who just right? let them. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I also like, uh, kind of what you were getting into. I mean, you're not going to logically coerce someone into it. They don't want to hear it. They, you know, maybe it's the feel. Maybe they like Firefox and Chrome and or Chrome because they, f I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's speed. I don't know why. It's just, I can't do Safari anymore. I feel like load page times this, and you know, this could be all server side as well, but it just feels so much better in Firefox and Chrome or Vivaldi than it does in Firefox. I think Edge is just garbage soup. Uh, Internet Explorer, don't even make me go down that route. But yeah, it, it it's a, funny to hear this uh, because they weren't even interviewing or questioning tech savvy people at all. So great article nonetheless. Uh, on that note, did you have any plug for uh, Vivaldi you wanted to throw in there? Oh, yeah. No, it didn't even mention Vivaldi here. This is another level of super brain that people, <laughs> those are the Vivaldi users. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right fair enough <laughs> uh, uh talking about speaking super of tools i was gonna say talking about tools here uh i'm gonna jump right into book stack and the services they use uh this is an article they posted the team posted about not the services that come with book stack but rather the what they use for i would guess kind of external for development for discussion for some of these external pieces analytics uh great write-up it's always good to see what other i would say organizations are using to get their work done um so i'm just gonna kind of run through this list here that dan brown put out on the services they use at bookstack uh first one they have here is github obviously central location for code management issue and feature request tracking uh planning release management all of that code contribution. I think he noted here he was on GitLab for a while uh, and he just moved to GitHub. He said, it, you know, it's closed source. He didn't like that, but it was more for exposure on his project. Uh, he did have, I'm going to, that was kind of the big one there. Uh, there are a few others that I want to touch on. Plausible, he uses for analytics. Uh, Crowdin, he uses for translation. Uh, Style CI, which I thought was an interesting one. He uses for code sniffing basically to confirm and lend his php code uh he did have php code sniffer in there he said he just switched to style ci uh for I, I think it was speed is essentially why he moved uh he has code climate in here uh that's an interesting one it's uh code analysis i i guess that looks at maintainability and i don't want to jump here but 
vulnerabilities as well, maybe. Um, he uses Hugo for the blog, which Hugo, I think, is just gaining more and more popularity. It is, Mailbag yeah. was one that he created himself to move away from MailChimp, Discord, and then Discord for kind of discussion, OVH for hosting. He did kind of make the note uh, that AWS and Google Cloud are out there as providers and they're more reliable, but he said he likes the uh, price range for OVH, even though there are data center fires and network configuration <laughs> issues, <laughs> network configuration issues, but he said he's happy with the price. And then kind of this last one here was an interesting one. Again, I had not heard of this, Algolia Doc Search. So all of his docs are written in, I think they're statically generated. And this doc search basically provides kind of, as it says, easy documentation search. So I don't know what, I, I, I love the article itself just because it kind of gives you a look in on what the organization's using. A lot of these don't really stick out too much. I was going to say it was a lot, it was a lot more than I thought it was definitely like, I think of book stack and I really think of just what's on GitHub and then where are they talking? I don't think of the analytics. I, I mean, hosting is kind of, he didn't need to post that, but it's out there. And then a lot of, a lot of stuff around sea Island thing really is what it kind of felt like. I guess there were two for uh, his code. There's, I would, I would almost kind of separate this in into infrastructure and collaboration. Sure. Right. So, like, collaboration being, you know, Discord and uh, GitHub, and 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 to a point, Hugo, um, especially because you can contribute to that since it is statically generated. Right. right? You can just submit a PR uh, instead of having like a. PHP app where you have to limit the people who can actually edit it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and then you have OVH um, and 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 Mailbag and 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 Doc Search even. And uh, if you run Umatrix, you'll see that a lot of docs. In order to search them, you're gonna have to whitelist some kind of a JavaScript third party you know, randomness. From, yeah. From, yeah. Exactly. From from some sort of provider um, who's going to to use this. Um, and this is interesting because what we've done it the Arcompose blog is that our search is simple JavaScript that's local to the instance, right? So it's, it's first party, right? It's, it's not third party. It's not reaching out anywhere else. Uh, and, and that's interesting because it doesn't scale very well, but we don't need it to scale very well. And uh, a lot of this, once again, comes down to, you know, what, what, what is the need, right? And, uh, you know, he has enough people, we're looking at his documentation and enough documentation that he's going to want something that's a little bit more intelligent than just a raw text match, right? Keyword but match, right? For for us, if I'm just trying to look up, you know, on which episodes did we talk about um, email, right? And and then I can just do a real quick search about you know mail, and I can pull up all the episodes that have mail in it, and and that's more than likely going to trigger something uh, in my head. Uh, also, we have that kind of categorized by. Uh, topic so we can see all of our uh, cam board episodes we can see all of our next cloud episodes as well um, but yeah this is this is what he needs right and it looks like a whole lot less of productivity tools and a lot more like monitoring infrastructure tools so very interesting i i did not take a look at this before but this is very interesting yeah this one was a recent one uh a week ago, maybe. Um, okay. But he also, along the book line of Bookstack here, we do have an update from the project itself. A security nice. release, in fact. A 21085. Uh, it's been released. And really, I think we'd mentioned this back a couple episodes about the issue. I think there was cross-site scripting with um, you, you, users that were logged in and had the ability to edit pages or publicly available pages to edit could kind of be hacked. And so this kind of just goes deeper, I guess, to fix that issue, but more along the lines with the storage and the public directories. So again, if you're going to let someone go on Friday and they know you might want to patch up to this version so they're not wiping out your entire storage for your book yep. sack instance. Um, 
And then there are a couple additional changes here. The concurrent page editing is now, there's a warning. I We have not run into that, I can say, but it's now, there's a warning now, basically, which is a pretty cool feature. And then some more uh, translations as well. But that's all I had for Bookstack. Don't know if you have anything you want to comment on that one. No, but I'll I'll touch on Nextcloud. So Nextcloud yeah, is interesting it. uh, that it's now supported on TrueNAS. Um, I'm actually running Nextcloud right now on my FreeNAS box, which was the precursor uh, to TrueNAS. Um, I still have to change the name over and do the update and all that. Whatever. All but that fun it stuff, looks, yeah. yeah. And uh, this was made, uh, the, w- the way I do it is I have a, a jail. Uh, that has one of the volume groups um, uh, bound. It has a, it's, it's, um, what is it called? Uh, BSD has a different way of doing it, but it's basically a mount, bind mount point. Um, I think it's called a null FS uh, b- mount point, and uh, it just binds that file system. It does some different ways to uh, accomplish the same thing basically but um, I mount the volume into that next slide instance and have all of my ZFS and, and all my configuration options in there as well um, so this is this is something that was accomplishable before and what I like to see is I love to see these kind of projects come together and I love to see them present a unified front with the the offerings that they have, um, and and Nextcloud is a a, a, a great uh, platform. Um, TrueNAS is a great platform, and coming together, this is just going to get the word out to more people, right? And the more, more and people more. are familiar oh, yeah. with this, right? The more you get this kind of undercurrent uh, in the community, and and not just the tech community, but everyone who's looking at home servers to say, hey. What's this next cloud thing I've been hearing about, right? So, so it, it gets the vocabulary out into the ecosystem, and then starting those conversations is a lot easier. Yeah, I agree. And I'll tell you what: the one thing that stuck out on the article for that next cloud with TrueNAS, especially. Now, I, I feel like I'm pretty familiar with the next cloud, next at least enough. TrueNAS, I'm not too familiar with. I have not spun up an instance of it deployed it but the one thing that kind of stuck out with that true nas was that you're able to host uh, i love how they kind of put a cap on it 20 petabytes of data which is a ton of data for a home user i mean i don't think you'd ever make it to that point um obviously if you're doing videos maybe you do but nonetheless i mean it's an enter i would you could almost classify that enterprise enterprise level well, so. and the cool thing about Nextcloud, and and I think we're going to start exploring this. Actually, I know we are because we have it on the roadmap, which uh, Jack and I completed last weekend. But we're going to explore uh, expansible block storage yep. uh, functionality. So this is the way that we're able to expand Nextcloud uh, in, in the cloud, right? Using using our setup with DigitalOcean. The the other part of Nextcloud that's interesting is that it also federates. So like your on-premise server, right? If, if you have one, like your home server, your actual home server, if that's running Nextcloud as mine is, can federate up to my Nextcloud instance in the cloud. And my files are available for me through federation anywhere. And I don't have to expose uh, publicly anything on my, on my LAN. So that's that's very very cool. Now that that would that's with tricks with you know VPNs and and point to point connections stuff like that. But at that point you you have a more stable connection right rather than be having to necessarily expose it out to the internet in order to to get it when you're on on uh, when you're rowing. Yeah. So big stuff from both of those providers, yeah, I'd say. Absolutely. The next news item I have here is firefly 3 service we i feel they keep chugging along as well um now we do have a different service we're going to be talking about today that does kind of a similar function but i will hold off until my segment for that with the firefly 3 update uh this one's kind of fun they find i I don't know if they how you were checking health checks before if you're pulling css if you're pulling just a curl on the site to make sure you're getting a 200 back but now they have this uh slash health will return 200 uh firefly 3 is up and running 
And then it looks like they're doing some more fixes for LDAP and there's an option to log via paper trail. So and I love kind of, I love kind of fun with that, that one. Yeah. I love having that help check. Uh, that is just a, a real ease of use, right? Especially when I have uh, a container like Firefly 3 that oh, is yeah. complex, right? It, it's, it's really easy for me just to access that health point. Yep. So incremental increase, 5.6.2 from them. And then mm-hmm. our favorite here, what we're taking a, a short break, a brief break from Run Deck. You'll be happy to hear Dark Mode is finally released with the 3.4.5 uh, release here. It looks like Papadum Coral Flag. I don't know if that was similar. We're it just gonna. Like, I'm, I'm, we're, yeah, we're not. We're not going to talk about the making names up words. Anymore. But um, nope. The major release in this, the major note in this release is that Dark Mode is now now available. Dark mode is a highly requested run deck feature. One of our, oh geez, rockstar devs made dark mode a reality nice. during PagerDuty's Hacker Week. So now you can run run, now you can run run deck in a dark background with white text. So. Now that is interesting too because I know that this is Hacktoberfest, right? So this is if you contribute to specific projects, you get like a T-shirt. I I, I know Digital Ocean is a part of that. I don't know who else is. Um, but that's a that's a big thing that's going around in the community this month as well. So I'm wondering if that wasn't because that's a CSS thing, right? That's not part super of that. complicated yeah, to right. pull out uh, it, it, to pull off. So so I would assume that there's a good chance that could be related as well. I'm just speculating here, but I've I've seen chatter in the community about this uh, this year. Um, so I just. As soon as you said our, our hack weekend or whatever, like oh hack maybe pa- yeah, Pager Duty's hack week. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how, what that looks like inter- if that's internal, external, but that's how when it was created. It sounded like so. Yeah, so just as- another fun one there. Uh, and then it looked like there were some UI UX releases, yeah. and then there were some. It looks like AWS integrations as well as some enterprise updates. So as Jack said, uh, we are going to be taking a break from Rundeck. Uh, so to go over the R Compose developments as a type of way to explain why we're going to take a break from Rundeck. Uh, so the the two R Compose developments we have here are actually new services. So instead of tiptoeing into uh, Q4, we decided just to break down the barricades and and uh, and sprint to the finish. And uh, we were able to get both of these services uh, spun up and running. And um, most of uh, accounting uh, goes to Jack, and, and I, I had a lot to do with Sweet CRM. Uh, I think we were both kind of working together towards the end there to pull it across the finish line. Uh, but in the end, I mean, we got we got two very, very solid, very enterprise-grade, uh, I would say, services um, across the line and, and available, right, in, in our upcoming releases. So... Uh, those are going to be available soon. Um, we are going to spend our next two episodes uh, talking about them, introducing them, uh, as it were. And the first, uh, the honor of the, the, the first one falls to Jack, uh, and he's going to introduce us to accounting. 